back to uh, the June's edition of ADEX Pixel Expo. I'm Sophia and I'll be your host for today. So we are, I'm very glad to be uh, to have Craig and David here today with us for the 5.30 session and I will just do a short introduction about the two of them. So first, firstly, we have David Strike, which is a pro be our moderator for today. David is a professional technical diver and he's also our ADEX ambassador for technical diving. Uh, as a former instructor, trainer and certifier with a background in military, commercial, recreational and technical diving, David has authored several hundred dive-related articles, so he's really well, really well accredited, and um, he's also our ADEX ambassador for technical diving pioneer, and he's a recipient of the ADEX Lifetime Achievement Award and a fellow of the Explorers Club of New York. So David will be our moderator for today, and joining us is uh, Craig Stephan, which is our special guest. He's the managing director of Nightboard Dive Expedition. Craig began diving in 1985 in the North Sea and was certified two years later in Australia. Today, Craig is the Managing Director of Nightboard Dive Expeditions with the knowledge gained during his dives in the Great Barrier Reefs towards Great Barrier Reefs, Coral Sea and the waters of Papua New Guinea and companies' responsibilities towards environmental protection. Craig's affiliations with NGOs, research groups and scientists are aimed at conserving the world's heritage for future generations. So today, they'll be discussing about messing about in boats and this is also part of our monthly In Conversation with David Strike session. So without further ado, I'll just hand over the time to the two of them and they will take you away into their, their rest insightful conversation. Thank you so much. Sophia, thank you very much for that glowing introduction. And uh, I think it's the first time I've ever been called a professional technical diver. So it's a step up in the world for me. Thank you. And um, welcome to Craig. Um, Craig for, uh, is in Cairns. For those that are not aware, uh, Cairns is about 2,000 kilometres north of where I am. I'm in Sydney, Craig's in Cairns, sweltering in the uh, warm tropical heat up there. So, Craig, welcome, and it's uh, good to see you. Thanks, Strikey. Nice, nice to be here. Um, I, I'm, I'm not so sure. Well, well, one, I think the list of you are so well revered, David. I mean, I'm glad there was nothing said about me here, and I, I couldn't compete with you, sir. Um, sweltering, though, it is positively Baltic up here, 17 degrees. It's becoming winter weather, which is really, really chilly. Trust me. We were. Actually, before we went live, ladies and gentlemen, we were just sort of comparing notes about uh, how soft we've become over the years. Um, Craig, as you probably or may have guessed from his accent, uh, is not a native born Australian. Um, Craig, you, you come from Edinburgh. Describe where, where you come from, actually. Okay, well, I'm from Edinburgh in Scotland, and hence the accent. But I, I, I will let our guests know as well that I do have a cold, so I might sound a little bit more, more, more different than normal. But um, I, I'm from Edinburgh. I grew up in Edinburgh and a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And uh, I, I emigrated to Australia in, uh, when I was 23. And uh, 1987, so you can do the maths, and uh, and and been here ever since. Although I, I obviously do frequent Scotland a fair bit, get back. I've still got family there, and um, but but this is certainly home and has been for a long time. So growing up in Scotland, what was it? I I have to ask, by the way, Scotland. I've never tried this, but it's it's home of that um, gastronomic delight, the fried Mars bar, is it not? Well, I believe, now I haven't tried it, David, and I believe that it's um, it's a bit of a bull bull story that was actually put out there. So I've never tried it. I've never seen it on a menu, so I don't actually know if it's real. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, I, I thought you were going to suggest haggis, and I, I think you've probably tried haggis. Um, but, you know, I think Scottish, uh, you know, people say that Scottish cuisine is based on a dare. And uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if someone certainly tried it. And the Royal College of Heart Surgeons, which I still think is the place to go for heart surgeons, is in Edinburgh. And I think there's a reason for that, kind of based around our diet, not the best. <laughs> Funnily enough, at, at one sort of stage of my life, I was um, out on a civilian uh, weather ship out in the North Atlantic. One of our duties was to catch squid. 
which went back to Edinburgh University for neurological research. So Edinburgh's sort of quite renowned, isn't it, for its uh, uh, medical yeah, studies I, there. Absolutely, absolutely. And I believe there's a, there's a, and as I said, I mean, I'm not familiar with it, but I certainly know that historically yeah. the Royal College of Heart Surgeons is, is there. And I still think it's revered for one of the places to, to study and learn and, 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 and there. But, you know, I would, I'd suggest, though, that that probably grew from, I can only think from Scottish diet, you know, we had, we, there's so many, and I think that our, um, I don't know, what was the average lifespan of a Scotsman? We probably all croaked it in our 50s, you know, I think so. And there was reason for that. So they had to start studying that. And I still think to this day, it's not that high, to be honest with you. And uh, and when I go home, I love I love going home. You know, it's like when you, when you leave, I mean, this is home. And I love this country so much. Um, but when I get home, I think, my goodness, you only go for a holiday. I think if you didn't go for a holiday, I, I would die. You, you know, you're subjected to bacon rolls and, and black pudding and steak pies and haggis and everything that's really bad for you. But it's so good. It's so good. Black pudding's not bad for you. Don't... <laughs> well, it's English, isn't it? They, they have a big <laughs> argument of, of, of if it's English or Scottish. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Hey, so how did you get into... Diet, what sort of activities did, well, you grew up there? So street, strangely enough, growing up as a as a young lad, we were always as a as a kid. Um, we, we were lucky enough. I grew up in a, a housing estate, if you like. My father um, was a police officer. I mean, he, historically, my family, strangely enough, are, are all connected with the ocean. My my, my grandfather, and um, we were from the north of Scotland. My grandfather was a, a marine engineer. And he spent all his life working as a marine engineer in the North Atlantic during the war and uh, doing deliveries way down to South Georgia, um, which is off um, Argentina to the south or, or near the Falklands to the whaling stations. So he spent all of his life um, and, and certainly came out just post-war and then ended up working in, at Brown Brothers, um, which is an engineering firm in, in Scotland, which in Edinburgh. Um, which had a lot to do with the maritime industry, you know, manufacturing hydraulics and all sorts of stuff for ships. And, and my father um, was a, a shipwright before he became a police officer. So, so he grew up um, working oh. as a shipwright or carpenter, you know, a shipwright for anyone yeah. who doesn't know, it's basically a carpenter that works on boats. And, um, and, and our house, <laughs> every nook and cranny, you'd go into a house, if it was under the stairwell or... Or in the coal bunker where you used to keep your coal, everything was pine panelled and little boxes on the electrical switchboard. And if you went in there with a tilly lamp, you'd think you were on a yacht, you know, you'd think you were on a boat. Um, but, but so I grew up, and in, in, as I said, my father was a police officer, and I grew up in a housing scheme in, in Edinburgh. And we, um, we were fortunate enough that next to our housing scheme, I mean, for those, those that know the UK, you, you, you live the city life, or if you were fortunate enough to get out and do a bit of country life, it was a totally different animal. So it was a choice of growing up as a kid and hanging around at the fish and chip shop and around the telephone box, or getting out into the country. Now, we had a farm adjacent to where we lived, and uh, the farmer adopted us kids. And I now know it's slave labor. And, we, and if he was still alive, I think he is. But we'd probably have a case against them. But he adopted them um, probably about six or eight kids. And uh, so, so we were really lucky from maybe we were 12 uh, through till we left school. We used to go and work on the farm. And uh, we, we were driving tractors and not combines, but we're driving tractors and taking the grain in. We had an old Bedford truck where we used to um, get the straw bales after, after we'd, um, we'd, we'd done the waffling to dry out the straw and a baler to make the bales. And it was all kids. And we did this all summer long. But as we, as we sort of got a bit older, did a lot of fishing. We'd, we'd always head off down the rivers and the streams and, and, and lakes, or lochs as we call them, um, fly fishing for trout. And um, my brother, he went off once he'd uh, finished his apprenticeship and he went off to Greece and um, went there and, and had a great time traveling around. And he returned to Scotland, um, a bit like Zorba the Greek, had a great suntan and I'm sure he'd been bleaching his hair or something, but he looked really exotic. And uh, he came back and he had a bug for windsurfing. 
And so he introduced me to windsurfing. And then all of a sudden we are out there windsurfing on all these Scottish locks and uh, having a great old time. But it, I just sort of was drawn, always drawn to water. As kids, we were, we, we grew up with, our parents always used to take us on, on holidays to beachside caravan parks. Um, where we'd have, uh, my, my dad had a, a little um, clinker built boat that we used to go out fishing in. And uh, so we were always around the ocean, you know, as kids, every summer holiday, it was in the ocean, it was fishing, it was mucking around in rock pools, climbing up sand dunes, it, it's what we did. And, and Edinburgh is a port city as well, you know, so we're right on the Firth of Forth. And um, got into windsurfing and... Uh, I, I don't know why, dark Scottish locks, freezing cold water, not like the azure blue that we have here in Australia, but, and I think I was the only kid that we went windsurfing, would fall into the lock and I would actually be back on the board bone dry because I was petrified. It was dark, peaty, never knew what was down there, there might have been a Loch Ness monster, I don't know, but I used to fall and I was back on the board within a breath, you know, within a breath. But look, that's, we were always around the water, and it was my brother, like yourself, became a, he moved on and became a commercial diver. And it was him that introduced me to dry, diving um, back in, when I say 1985, I think. He right, whereabouts me. did you do that? We, we dived down in Eyemouth, which is on, on the East Coast, just to the south, uh, just to the south of Edinburgh, sort of heading right. towards Newcastle, yeah, yeah. So, so one of his mates, Barry, who's from Newcastle, a majority and, and and Barry became a commercial diver as well. But um, he was uh, into before he became a commercial diver. He did a lot of recreational diving. So we got all kitted up, and um, I had a nine millimeter wetsuit. You know, the big thick rubbery thing with the with the hood. And I had no idea what I was doing. And it's not like I went through a course. You know, brother, well, you'll be right. Put the kit on, and. Uh, Anyway, got all the gear on. I'm like, you know, you like this with your wetsuit and freezing before I even got in the water. Strikey, I was. But um, when I jumped in the water with all the gear on, I didn't, I didn't exactly get a, a you know, a good induction. It was like, just what do you do? Just, just breathe, swim around, just breathe, follow me. And uh, he, my brother to this day says. He, I said, you never told me the golden rule, brother, about um, never holding your breath. I did. So to this day, I know he didn't. <laughs> and, uh, I jumped in the water and I was like a scalded cat. And I don't know if it was the cold. It was the, it was the, the fright. I was, anyway, I was hanging on the rocks like a scalded cat, hanging on the barnacles going, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if this is for me. I was petrified. I was freezing. There was a big swell going on. Anyway, he said, relax, breathe, you're fine. I relaxed and I breathed. And then next thing I was down pulling myself through um, kelp beds and we were on a mission catching lobster. And it was just my eyes. It was just one of the most, it was surreal. It was absolutely surreal. You know, I'm there on the surface, never had my head under. The next thing I'm, I'm, I'm swimming through these forests and um, I came up on my brother and he's got his head in this rock and he's, he's in there catching lobsters and, and I'm watching, I was just so excited, <laughs> wide eyed. And he turned around and he, 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 he got the biggest fright and, um, and his eyes were like this, you know, but it was just amazing, fascinating, exciting. It was just fun, fun, fun. So you so had this my... sudden, just this complete turnaround from- Never died from before, yeah. in you go. And I came out and I went, wow, wow, yeah. So what happened after that? Did you continue over there and do a course? No, I didn't or? because it's too cold, David. Get real. Yeah. Freezing. It's Baltic. And it's it was, I had such a, a buzz. It was such a fun and exciting thing to do. But <clears throat> I did it once. We carried on with a windsurfing. And I think you were talking about, you know, when you're working out in the North Sea and everything's getting ice. We used to go out windsurfing until the ice was forming on the sheet, on the sail. And there we go, it's ridiculous. But um, no, shortly after that, my, my, my brother, again, he, he decided he was going to Australia and he was going to go on a working holiday to Australia. And um, he met a girl and, uh, and, 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 and Mary, who he's married to today, lovely, lovely girl. And um, 
And he said, well, Mary, I'm thinking of going to Australia. I said, uh, do you want to come? And she basically said, uh, no, I'm not going to Australia. I'm doing my nursing. I'm not going anywhere. So he decided that, you know, I'll not go to Australia and I'll stay home. She is a lovely girl. He's still there to this day. So he made the right choice, obviously. And um, then he said, I was working as a trade. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm actually an auto electrician by trade, which is, is what I did in my, in my youth. Wanted to be a, a police officer, but the world was changing at that time. My father suggested I shouldn't do that. And um, I became a sparky. And uh, then my, but I was a bit, you know, I was a bit lost. I was just, I was in my twenties. I was going, what am I going to do in my life? Is this for me? I'm miserable. I used to get up every day. I was like a half shut knife with the cold and I struggled. I was born in Scotland. I wasn't meant to live in Scotland. You know, I was <laughs> miserable, miserable. It's like they say about Scottish people. They walk around like half shut knives and they're looking for worms all the time because they're just bent over, going up against the gale force winds and the rains. And it's just, it can, it's beautiful. If there's any Scottish people listening, it's beautiful, but it's miserable too. So, um, <laughs> I, yeah. I, um, well, my, my that's, that's your like, job with the tourist board. That's it, exactly. He said, Why don't you go to Australia? Yeah. And I mean, all I knew about Australia was koala bears and kangaroos and not much more. And, uh, so I, I did. I went down to Hobart House and um, I, I uh, made an application to come out on a working holiday visa to Australia. And I came out, I think we needed like 1,500 quid and a return ticket. And uh, I got here when I was 23. So, yep. yeah, that was and it. Where did, you, where did you arrive? In Sydney. Sorry, where about? In Sydney, right? In Sydney, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we just, um, we ended up in the rocks in Sydney. I had no idea about anything, to be honest with you. We backpacks, but myself and my girlfriend. And uh, we ended up um, down in the rocks in Sydney. And the exchange, I think it was the exchange pub or something like that, down in the rocks. And I went and girlfriend and I sitting on the on, on a bench and I said, right, well, we need to find somewhere to stay. We had no plan. We just had our backpacks and no plan. I had a tent. If we got stuck, I had a little tent. And uh, we went down, I had a beer, and then I got out the telephone book and I looked for somewhere to stay, phoned a couple of hotels, and again with no idea, we ended up in Springbrook Brook Crescent in King's Cross, of all places, in 1987, you know, under oh, belly time. Yeah. And uh, so we ended up actually staying in a, a hotel in King's Cross, right in the heart of everything that was going on. And uh, so that's where we started our, our adventure in Australia was um, in King's Cross. So what happened? You came over, was that for like a, a working holiday for a year or whatever? But then you managed to stay. Exactly right. So came over for a working holiday visa. <laughs> and then we did um, three months and just built up a little bit of cash. Yeah. Um, got a hold in Kingswood, as you do, and got set up to go travelling. And uh, so we got a bit of cash together, found employment as well. So we both had good jobs and we were doing quite nicely. It was good. But the whole idea was to travel around Australia and see as much as we could. So we, um, we got a car and then we headed off up the east coast of Australia. And we finally got up to when we got to the Wet Sundays and um, we decided to do a course and we did a, a diving course in the Wet Sundays. And um, Great Barrier Reef Diving Services, I think it was, David Dickinson was my instructor um, back then. And we did the course. And, and again, just, it was incredible. You know, I mean, we, we, we did the course. We thought we were in paradise. You know, we're eating coconuts off the tree and watermelon. And it, it was just so very, very different from anything that I'd, I'd done historically. And uh, it just loved it. So we did the course at the Wet Sundays and um, we did our, our dives, our, our open water dives out on Hook Island. Um, Summer Cloud Bay, I think it is, on the north side of, of Hook Island. And it was just a different world, strikey. You know, it was like, I mean, from pulling my way through the, the kelp beds in Eyemouth to diving in, in this these coral gardens with these huge boulder corals which was I didn't know where I was I really didn't know where I was I thought I was in outer space you know and you, you above the star the Great Barrier Reef still does that to me today today after all these years above the surface head below the surface and like wow 
And um, so after that, I, I, I was hooked. I was hooked into diving, you know, and uh, we, we then moved from, we, we, we continued up to... Um, How long did you stay in the Whit Sunday area? For? We, we were only there because we, we had a bit of a, a plan, which was to travel up the East Coast and then go up to Darwin, the Northern Territory, yep. and, and down through Ayers Rock and South Australia, not WA, but we did everything else. So we were on a bit of a bit of a programme. And, and the idea was we'd sort of calculate, well, we weren't going to work. We kind of looked for work, but I don't, I don't think we were... We were either lazy or not very experienced at finding the right work that suited us. So we we tended just to make a plan, spend our money, go back to our real our jobs in Sydney, which were still waiting. So we um we we went on a liveaboard up in Cairns and uh, Deep Sea Divers Den, which I shouldn't be advertising to someone else, but uh, I, I think it was something Queen or whatever. We went out and did the local the Tropic Queen. Tropic Queen. Tropic Queen. <laughs> one. So so we did a, a three day or two night whatever liveaboard on the Tropic Queen out to the reef stuff here in Cairns and and had the time of our lives. You know, we we're just living it. We just. I don't know. We felt like rock stars. It was wonderful. Absolutely what wonderful. year was this? That was in 1987. Right. Okay. 87. Yeah. That just as an aside, that Tropic Queen. Yeah. Uh, it was the boat Lee Marvin used to use it for marlin fishing right. when he came over. Right. 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 And it yeah. subsequently wound up at Jarvis Bay down in uh, just south of Sydney. There you go. Yeah. And, and I knew I knew all about Lee Marvin and the history of him up here yeah. because I think he put he put Marlin fishing on the map, I believe, up here in the far north. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. And um, so so you know. So, sorry, that, you were I, I I cut across you then. So you were out on the liverboard, yeah, out of cans. And, and and it was wonderful. Drew, who was the, the skipper. I mean, diving back then, as you know, was very different. You know, I mean. And um, we got invited up to the wheelhouse and there was a carton of beer and everyone's drinking, the, everyone, including the captain. And um, Drew, who was a character who sadly died a few a few years ago, and he, he was a local, very well-known character. Um, but, you know, he's up there in his underpants and he's singlet, you know, real Aussie. I mean, uh, just amazing. But, uh, but look, we had a fantastic time and, and, and all of the crew really welcomed us and, and it was just a... a a fantastic time in our lives as, as young people, you know, it really was. Yeah. And um, we so so from there we we dived and then we carried on and and drove into the outback um, and, and and no idea what was um, in front of us in the outback. We had an old Kingswood that never had a temperature gauge, but it had a, had a had a warning light that would come on the dash when the engine got a little bit hot. And we're driving out from uh, Townsville out through Mount Isa. And uh, you're going across creeks, you know, the Dead Man's Creek and all this sort of stuff. And it's getting hotter and hotter and drier and drier. And uh, we got to the stage where the old king's would we just sort of put a thumb over the red light and just, you know, yeah, it's gone out, we're fine, <laughs> let's go, you know. But uh, that's what you did. You were young and dumb. And that's yeah. what you did. And we ended up, <coughs> we, we managed to get a right round Australia, but we got to the point where we drive early in the morning or late in the evening when it was cool. Right. <laughs> so, so you know, that was it. Our adventures around Australia, Darwin, wonderful, Kakadu National Park, which is absolutely stunning. Um, and then down through Ayers Rock. And we, we were lucky. It was one of those no plans. And we just went. And, and we arrived at... Uh, in, in Ayers Rock, with the Henley on Todd Regatta. Yeah, oh, you yes. know that? Yeah. yeah. That was on. It's like we, we just rock up in this town and there's boats in the dry riverbed, you know, and the, and the Todd Riverbed, and, and they're all amazing. And it's like a beer festival and all these boats careering around the place in the dry riverbed on wheels. And um, then we ended up down in South Australia to the Grand Prix was on in Adelaide. I never knew there was a Grand Prix on, but we stayed there for a week and we went to see Billy Joel and it was just like, all these boxes, it was just fantastic. An, an amazing <laughs> holiday. No planning, just happened. Yeah. And uh, then back to Sydney. And um, and you know what made me stay here, David, was, as I said, I love windsurfing. I've resurrected it recently. I'm getting I'm getting on a bit, you know, but you've got to hang on to your youth as best you can. And um, I, I was... Um, windsurfing on Botany Bay 
And it was March. It was it was March. And I had to March, I had to go back to the UK in April. My one year was up. And um, I'm windsurfing across Botany Bay, and it was 25 knots of breeze, blue azure waters, just having the best time of my life. You know, 23 in my boardies, ripped. Not so ripped these days. <laughs> ripped, going across the ocean, thinking, I, I, I can't leave this behind. I can't go back home. So I, um, I then went, looked into um, getting sponsorship um, from the company I was working with. And asked them if they sponsored me. They said, yeah. And I found out it was a, it was a bit of a tick list. You know, you could be a, a hairdresser or a bricklayer or an electrician at the time. And so I was on the list. And uh, so happy days. And I went to the um, immigration, Department of Immigration. I hope they're not listening. And uh, they said, well, you have to leave the country. You've got to go home and make your application. And then you can apply and you can come back in. And then I had a, had a mate that said to me, he said, don't do that. He says, you'll see the forms as you exit the building. The forms are there. Get the forms, fill them in, and, and, and um, put them in. So I did. I grabbed the forms on the way out of the building. I didn't go back to the UK. I grabbed the forms, filled them in, posted them in, and I got another eight months while my visa was being processed. And then happy days, I got welcomed to Australia as a resident after that. So, Oh, lovely. So that was the goal. And you're, so you're, you're in Sydney now. I'm in Sydney now, and uh, I think Dive 2000 was a shop that we, we got involved. I was living in the eastern suburbs, and uh, Dive Dive 2000 down in Rushcutters Bay, small dive shop. And I think oh, had, Rick Swansborough. Yeah, and I, th- I think they had two shops at the time, maybe, and a small one in Rushcutters Bay. Mm. And um, we'd worked up a bit of cash, so we went down and bought all the dive gear. And next thing we were diving around Sydney and down in Jarvis Bay, and it was just wonderful. And, and dived, you know, that became our hobby on the weekends: windsurfing, scuba diving, and right. um, spent many, many years in in, in Sydney and um, diving around there, going up the east, going up the east coast a bit as well, up to um, Fish Rock Cave and and uh, up to oh come on, Craig, which which you know I I really want to. I've been completely spoiled up here. Because the diving up here is fantastic, but I, I I do intend to do an East Coast run again and and dive, you know we dived in Solitary Islands, Split Solitary Islands, South Split yeah. Solitary was wonderful. Haven't done North, um, Fish Rock Cave, For- Foster Ton Curry, and I mean just some fabulous diving down on the East Coast. So that that was that was my hobby, um, diving and windsurfing. So you know? how did you? How, you're working as a an electrician. Yeah, yeah. You're in Sydney. How did you wind up in Cairns? Yeah, good question. So, so I, 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 the girl that I travelled to Australia with, my childhood sweetheart, who I'm still very fond of and, and friends with, and, and she's gorgeous. She lives in Sydney. And um, I suppose we got to a point, you know, we'd known each other from when we were very, very young and, and um you know, I'm not, I won't divulge anything on here and get some therapy from our guests. But look, we, we ended up going our separate ways when I was around 30. And um, and she's moved on and she's got a couple of lovely girls down there. And I said, OK, so this is a change of life for me. And I was I was a sparky and I was doing it for the sake of doing it, David. I mean, I, I actually still don't know what I want to do yet. Um, but at that time... Um, I knew I didn't want to be a sparky anymore. And um, I've always ridden motorcycles. From being a kid, I used to race motorcycles. And I've had, I, there's not a day in my life since I was 16 that I, I haven't ridden a motorcycle on the road. And, I, and I'm a bit of a, a fan of old ones and I do up old motorcycles. But anyway, I left Sydney and I, I bought a, a big Kawasaki 1000, a Mad Max thing, something I'd always craved from my childhood. And, um, and I said, right, that's it. Everything sold, got on my motorcycle, and I had nothing. I had my, my gear bags and my bike, and, and this was it. And I, I headed off uh, to the north for a new life, and, and that's what I did. Although I, I think um, the night that I left Sydney, I, I, I only got about maybe 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers out of Sydney, and it was raining so hard. Um, I was super saturated, as you know, the rain that you get down there or in Australia in general. And my bike was misfiring and I'm, I'm under this bridge and um, my bike wouldn't run. And I'm going, it's not meant to be like this. Oh, it's just not meant to be like this. 
<laughs> so, uh, there I was, and you know, blown out my spark plug caps and all the rest of it, waited till the rain um, receded, and then I took off and, and, and went up north. At that time, my sister was working as a nurse in Cairns. And um, so I came up and I spent about, I spent a good part of a year. Um, I, she was she had a boyfriend who was involved in diving. And uh, at that time, I was still an open water diver. Um, and he, when I, when I came up to Cairns, I, I lived with her for a while. And then he put me through courses. I did my advanced course and my rescue, which is the best course ever. And um, it, then it was with Nawi. I did all my, my right, yeah, with Nawi, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, came on, became a dive master. And then with the dive shop that, that he was running at the time, I then started going out to the reef and um, taking resort divers out. <clears throat> and I was just going out as a dive master with them. And, and I spent a year basically going out as an assistant dive master. And, you know, and, and, and I just... It was just a wonderful, wonderful time in my that life. That was what day running and day running, this would yeah. be, yeah. Was going out of Cairns and Yorkies Knob. There was a um, ah yes, yeah, out of Yorkies, and uh, this is really bad, and I'm I'm having a bit of a blank here on the name of the vessel, but it will come to me. And so it was a sailing boat. That used kangaroo to go Explorer. No, it wasn't Kangaroo. No. It was Upolu. It was out to Upolu K, just just off um, right. just off Cairns, and we'd go out there daily and and. Um, you know, two or three times a week. And, and look after, and then I went out on a, an expedition with Mike Ball and, and as a guest. I went out as a guest on, on Mike Ball and um, I did my, uh, I did, uh, I went out in a, on a three night cod hole expedition. Loved it, met the crew, thought this is just the business, chatting to the crew. And, you know, I'm trying to say, you, you do this for a living. You get paid to do this. You're having a laugh. You get paid to go out and swim around the ocean and live this, in, what I thought, an incredible, incredible lifestyle. And um, so I got chatting to the crew and, and, and got on famously with them while I was out there as a guest. And they said, you should try and come out as a volunteer. And, um, and I did. I went out as a volunteer. And then I, the trip I ended up on, they were making a, a movie um, a, a kid's series called Ocean Girl. And so I ended up on this boat with all these rock star movie stars. And, and, and you know, and, and the, the, I think the director was, he, he lived in Port Douglas, but we, anyway, we went out onto Opal Reef and spent two weeks on Opal Reef making movies. And I was just a slave to the machine. You know, the chef felt sorry for me. So she took me for a dive or two every day, which was fantastic. But um, I didn't get to see the, you know, the Barrier okay. Reef and beyond. But after that two weeks, again, got on well with the crew and they said, you know, you should apply for a job here. So I applied for a job there uh, with Mike Ball in 1995 and um, and been working with Mike Ball ever since. Now, just back one, you were, you mentioned the, the cod hole. Just explain, for the benefit of people that are not sort of familiar with the area, that's the top end of that ribbon reefs uh, correct yeah 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 so the, the ribbon reef section so you know the great barrier reef is some two and a half thousand kilometers long plus it's he, a huge reef system but from north of um north of uh, cairns where where i am cooktown which is a fair drive there's lots of diving off cairns but day boats can get there in a couple of hours but the cod hole is a good we, we, we actually, we had an expedition tonight. We left port tonight. So we'll be steaming all night. We'll get there tomorrow morning. So <coughs> some 230 kilometers north of Cairns is the cod hole and the, the top of the ribbon reef section. So so that's where we'll actually be steaming to tonight and all the way up there. And so it's a long way from anywhere. So you can't get there by day boats. You can only get there on liveaboard, liveaboard dive vessels, yeah. And the cod hole is quite a unique area. There's a, there's a family of big potato cod there. And um, so, and they're always around and pretty friendly. And, you know, they're, they're what Mike's always regarded them as diver-sized fish, you know, they're these big. Have you have you been up there? Oh, yes. Yeah, you have. Okay, there you go. I thought yeah. you had. But, um, and, and, and it's wonderful. You know, the, the reef is, it is so far away from everything. It's very remote and just a lovely place to be. So that was the expedition I did, was a fly dive, which we still do. And we've been doing it forever. So we, we flew up on a Monday morning and we do a low level flight over the barrier reef. We only fly 300 meters above the reef as we did then. 
still doing it today. And we take everyone right out over the, the, the outer barrier reef. So you get to see the where the Pacific Ocean comes in and meets the barrier reef, out over that. And then we land in Lizard Island and then transfer to the vessel. And an hour and a half, we're at the Cornhole. Now, so you're back in, what, 95? How many boats? Because Mike Ball had a number of vessels yeah, at that yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah, he did. And, and, I mean, Mike was a trailblazer. There's no yeah. doubt about it. I mean, he sort of came on from, you know, when, when, when recreational diving became popular, you know, Mike and others around the globe were right there at the forefront. And, and Mike had the – he had the very first purpose-built liverboard in the world built, um, which was water sport. And a fabulous boat. So that was built in the very early 80s. And then, then he built Super Sport. So at that time, we had Water Sport, which was an old steel hulled boat, fa yeah. fabulous boat. Then he had Super Sport built, and I think she was launched in 86. Again, a big catamaran, aluminium catamaran. We had 26 guests on there, I believe, and 10, 11 crew. And she was about, she was 24 meters. And then in 1989, we had Spoil Sport built. Bigger again, she's up to 30 metres, say, 29 guests and 11 crew. Changed that a little bit since. And Spoil Sport is still our main vessel um, because she was the best boat ever built in the fleet. Paradise Sport was another one. So at one point in time, you had Water Sport. She was going out, moving on. We had Super Sport, Spoil Sport. And Paradise Sport, which was built in 1997 and uh, built by Oslo Ships in Western Australia. And then that vessel went up to, it was purpose built to go to Papua New Guinea. And so ended up up there. So you had four boats going on at one time for a short period. So you actually worked in PNG as well, Papua yeah, New Guinea, yeah, yeah. on Paradise best, Sport. Yeah, yeah, best time in my life. Papua New Guinea was just... How long were you up there for, Craig? Well, I, I, I got... 1997 is when I went up there. We had one of the trip directors, unfortunately, got decompression illness. And um, we... we <laughs> I, got, I got flown in. It was a 10-night expedition. Mike was just showcasing Paradise Sport. He had all these notaries or agents coming from overseas. Barry Andwather was on the trip as well, you know, from Diamond. Yep. Barry was on and all these others. Andy was getting flown out because he had decompression illness. Mike and I flew up on a private charter um, to, to Kaviang, which is way in the far north of PNG, yeah. two degrees from the equator. So, so we were up diving, and, and I got flown into trip direct. So I, I'd already started trip directing. I'd, I'd gone very quickly from a dive master, first mate, trip director, and then next thing I'm getting flown into Papua New Guinea to run a 10-day expedition in Kaviang. I had no idea about the diving, where I was, what I was doing. I'd never dived there. I didn't have a bloody clue. Um, but I was the only one apparently available at the time that could maybe pull it off. And uh, so they flew me in and we flew Andy out. So at 97, I started. That was my first expedition. And I worked there through till 2002. So we used to do, I, I used we used to do my initially three months, and then yep. I came back and signed a contract for a year, and I worked on the vessel for a, a year solid as a trip director. We did um, six seven night expeditions back to back, and then we had two days off, and then we'd run a, a, a ten day expedition, and then another six six seven nighters back to back. <laughs> And, and a couple of days on the and it, for a year and then back. And then I did six months up, six what months were back. You, what were your actual duty as a trip director? What were you doing? Sort of yeah. instructing as well? And Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, basically you're the, managing all of the diet. Yeah. You know, it's guest administration, looking after the guests, yeah. making sure they get what they came for, making sure they have a great time, coordinate the diving. Safety first always has been the case with us. Um, but, but that was it, really, just in, in planning the expeditions and just putting on great itineraries, yeah. you know. Just, uh, great times, great times. Just back to yourself, what, how's your diving developed? 
because I, are you into uh, rebreathers, for example? Or? I've, I've done it, David. I did, I did um, strikey. I did, I did uh, with um, Jason from Dive, Dive, Dive down in, in Kelso, down in, in Brizzy. So we, we, we have, we, we've grown technical diving within the company. And, and, and a few years ago, there was a big surge in technical diving and rebreather diving. And so, and Trevor Jackson, who's one of our skippers yeah. here, you know, he's, he's sort of infamous within the, um, the, the technical diving realms. And uh, so Trev's, a, a, and we've run wreck expeditions as well up here. And um, so, so for me, though, I, I've always, I've done the technical diving thing, which is, which is all good and well, but I think it has, it has a place, you know, it has a place undoubtedly. And, and if that's on, whether it's in caves or it's on wrecks and it's deep and to spend time to get down into onto a wreck and spend real time there. But I feel, I've always felt for what we do up in the tropics, it's like going into a safari park. You go to look at beautiful things. So I, I don't feel that you need all the technical jargon and everything else that goes with it. Yeah. Open circuit for me up here works perfectly fine. We, we go down and look at beautiful things, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and really, so I think for what we do, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, certainly a lot of expeditions that we've done up in PNG. I mean, I, I did the rebreather uh, diving, but again, I, I just can't see reason for it up, up here. Um, up in New Guinea, I did a fair bit of wreck diving up there, but it was only open circuit that I was doing up there. And even back then, most of our divers, they just came and dived off, off tables and open circuit, not rebreathers. Um, so I've never really found with the type of style of diving that we do to do yeah. anything more than open circuit. Yeah. Tell me some of your, you do a lot of exploration diving mm. up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we, you know, like one of the things that Mike, I think, um, you know, he, as I said, a bit of a trailblazer, you know, and, and, and some of the areas that we used to visit, and we, we actually, actually still dig out to this day. I've got boxes of well, wreck, wreck information and, and I've got boxes of, of, of charts and, and old dive sites that we visited back in the in the early in the 80s you know and I dig them out and we go back to these places and visit them and dig out a dive site and you know we saw sort of, that you know and, and just have a look see what was there let's go and try it again so so we've always I've always I love the adventure and, and it's why in Papua New Guinea I just love the adventure and it's one of the things that I loved up there is we were building itineraries back there and I was given the freedom to grow itineraries and and i know what people want i i know why they're coming whether it's you know to be pelagics or diving current or to look at pretty things to look at unusual critters so i've evolved lots of itineraries to um so so anyone can look at a site we've got at the moment we've got nine different expeditions that you can do we've got a couple of classics that we can say first time in australia come and do this you'll get the best of the barrier reef you'll get right. the best of the coral sea but I've evolved lots of other expeditions, so those that come back time and time again can do something different. What is the blah, 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 blah. what variety? Well, look, I mean, we've got our seasonal diving as well, yeah. So I mean, out yep. in the Coral Sea, we've got the the big blue and the drop offs and lots of sharks. We love sharks, so we do shark feeding. Um, but we, but on seeing that shark feeding, a lot of people go, oh, shark feeding. But, you know, we've worked very closely for since way back in 2010 with Marine Parks Australia to, to develop a, a marine park. So in 2018, after lots of consultation over the years, working really, really hard to get some zoning out of the Coral Sea, we managed to get Osprey Reef as a shark sanctuary now. So it's completely protected. Um, Bougainville to the south has got about 75% protection. Then Flinders and Holmes, again, further south, they've got not, they've not been gifted the same protection, but there's no commercial fishing now there. So, and recreational fishing, which is very remote, but it's, it's limited yeah. in what people can do. So, you know, so, we, so we've got that for lovers of the big blue and big drop-offs and deep water and sharks, coral sea. On the ribbon reefs, We've got amazing biodiversity. You know, the, 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 the ribbon reefs are fabulous because the coral is so prolific 
Um, you know, we can talk about, you know, bleaching and all the rest of it, but the coral is prolific and the fish life as a result of that, it's, a, it's an incredible combination of life. It's just so busy on the, on the, on the river reefs. And then as you get further north, when we get, we do, we dive all the way up to um, Cape York. As you get further north, the continental shelf comes in a little bit closer. So we've got more upwelling of deeper water, cleaner water hitting the barrier reef. So we have, uh, as you get further north, the corals start to change. We're starting to get closer and closer to the equator, warmer water. But we have more pelagic action on the river reef section, if you like, to way to the far north. But you also have amazing corals. So as you get further north, you've got a, a bit of the coral sea and a bit of the barrier reef all together. Yeah. And um, and then once we get way up north, up to Rain Island, we we go like seasonally again. We dive up there in November and December, which is the largest green turtle rookery in the world. David Attenborough, if you've seen David Attenborough's yeah. um, series then that's where a lot of that filming takes place so we dive around there and again the corals are different and um, prolific fish life uh, but the chance to get in the water we can go to it's a protected area and um, but there are areas that we're allowed to dive um, to the front so you get an opportunity to get in the water and there's turtles everywhere it's incredible so so there's a lot of variety hammerheads um, during our winter months if you're if you're lucky enough out at osprey reef we can see schooling hammerheads in the winter months scalloped hammerheads, great hammerheads any time of year. And then right now, we've just started our minke expedition. So we've got, so, so you know, I mean, I feel that um, what, what I love about the barrier reef is seasonally, it's always different. Yeah. On any expedition, you never know what you're going to see. We, we get a lot of, um, which seems to be increasing in numbers as well, are whale sharks. And, and we get more juvenile whale sharks over here. Really? But those yeah. numbers are increasing. And we see them yeah. at Osprey Reef. We've got video footage of, we've got guests all sitting watching a shark feed. And then, a, 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 you know, a whale shark will swim through the shark feed. You know, so you just never know what you're going to see. Tell me about Osprey Reef. I mean, I've been out there, but tell the tell the people about Osprey Reef. That's that's one of your favourite um, sites. No, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, it's, it's, it's called the jewel in the crown, you know, of, of, yeah. of the the coral sea reefs but i think the shark population is is um it's got a big shark population gray reef sharks uh, or gray whalers whale sharks and um, white tip reef sharks and uh, we see silver tips and as i said hammerheads and we see great hammerheads any time of the year but um during the um during the winter months it's, it's, you can see schooling scalped hammerheads uh, and you need, the, I mean, you see the hammerheads, you see them more when there's a bit of current running, you know, so it's, um, it's sort of more inducive to seeing them then. But the Osprey Reef, it's, it's a beautiful reef. It's got, um, you know, it, it's exposed on a low tide, but it drops to a couple of thousand metres. So you've got these cliffs of crystal clear water, you know, 40, 50 metre visibility is not uncommon out there at all and beyond at times. Um, but the resident population of sharks said as well. So, so we do do a shark feed. It's an educational thing. It's not a. It's definitely not a Yahoo experience. We only feed yeah, them yeah. a small amount of of, of, of bait. But, um, but, but the sharks are studied as well. We have affiliations with Ames and JCU, and so there's constant research going on out there with the sharks as well. So, um, but it's just it's just a wonderful place. You know, it's a beautiful beautiful area and soft corals, huge soft corals. And, and it's, it really is quite stunning. The, um, in, in recent times, there's been a lot of adverse sort of publicity about the barrier reef with, with coral bleach in it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, look, the narrative has been, and it is, look, as I said, I've been diving, I've been diving on the reef since 1987. When I started with, with Mike, and, um, and, and, and I know you'll know this. If you've done the Ribbon Reefs, you'll know a dive site called Pixie's Pinnacle, which is quite yeah. a sort of famous pinnacle dive. And I recall when I went there um, in, in, the, in the early 90s, in the mid 90s, sorry, it's a stunning little reef. It's, a, you know, it's only 30 metres up to, and again, it dries on, on a low tide. But it's got really prolific hard coral growth on there and lots of life because it sits as a bit of a monolith out in the, on its own and all this life around this reef and it's just stunning but i've watched that reef come and go come and go come and go over the years now whether it's been crown of thorns starfish which we don't have too many issues with up north um 
cyclones. We've had lots of cyclones over the years. And then more recently, the coral bleaching. I mean, we've had, look, I've seen coral bleaching from way back in the 90s. And I know it's been happening way before then. But I've been watching coral bleaching over the years. The narrative has been in since 1617, there's lots of talk about how the reef is dying. And but there was very little talk about how the reef is recovering. It's always about the doom and yes. the reef is dying, the reef is diving. Now, yeah. if, buts, if these bleaching events are occurring more often than not, then it, the coral has much less time to recover. Yeah. So if we have a bleaching event happening every a big one happening every five years instead of every 10 years or happening every two years, we're in trouble. The reef is going to struggle to recover. But there has been a lot of change since. The, the, the growth on the reef at the moment is nothing short of spectacular. I can dive on Pixie's Pinnacle today and it looks every bit as good as it did in 1995. Some of the sites that we, we dived that, that had were impacted quite badly in 1617 were, were desolate on top. Now you go and they are stunning, absolutely stunning. And you, we've got um, some reefs, you know, you've got these big tabletop corals, the big plate corals. Now a lot of them died and, and depends upon where they were. Yeah. And, it wasn't so much the reefs on the outer reef because they get washed, there's upwelling, there's cooler water, there's strong currents coming through there. The reefs on the inside to the lagoon side, the mid-shelf reefs, fringing reefs around islands, they were the ones that were impacted mostly. But the recovery on the outside of the reef has been great. Now, it's that regrowth now that there's a lot of talk about is that how the coral reef is recovering so quickly. And but there will be changes, I'd suggest. I mean, you'd, you'd be talking to the researchers and the scientists about this, but Tim, you, you almost think that we're looking at such a tiny little window of time and what we are seeing. The reef's been there for thousands of years, and we are looking at this tiny little window of time, you know? And, and, I, and one of the things I always, what always amazed me um, when, when, when you come out and you look at a beautiful reef, if you look under the, the gorgeous coral roof, it's dead underneath because the coral dies. The coral gets smashed with cyclones. The coral has historically been, it's, it's been impacted by bleaching and all the rest of it. But the coral continues to grow on top of it. And then right now, it's, it's looking remarkable. Yeah. But the reef is under pressure. There's no ifs and buts. I mean, our, our, um, the bleaching is an issue. Global warming is an issue. Elevated temperatures is a huge, huge problem. But it is encouraging to see that the reef is is fighting, is, is battling, and and it's it's doing. You know, I wouldn't say it's doing great at all. I'd be doing myself a, a misservice by saying that. Um, but um, but the reef is 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 doing as well as it can do at these at this time. You know, but um, right now I could take you to places striking. It, it would blow you away. It would absolutely blow you away. And there's a lot of protection that uh, you put in place to help. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you know, I think that in 2004, I got involved. When I came into the office in 2002 as operations manager, we had the we had the RAPS program back then. So Great Barrier Reef Marine Parks were rezoning the reef. And um, from a, you know, I, I recall in the early days when I went out, we could go diving on reefs, but there was fishermen there. There's fishing line all over the reefs, and it was just bizarre. We've got some of these incredible dive sites, and the fishermen out there smashing all the fish. <laughs> And uh, but that's just how it was back then. And in yeah. 2004, um, the RAPS program, Representative Areas program, we lots of stakeholders got involved, whether it was recreational fishers, commercial, game fishers, um, fish collectors, scuba diving, all the stakeholders got together, environmentalists, and we all got together around the table and, um, you know, fought. Got the, got the gloves off and got into it and then did our best to get the protections that we wanted. And so back then on the GBR, lots of uh, rezoning was done. So there was complete protection, green zones, pink zones that you can't even go into. They're only for scientific research. And I, I would imagine they use them as a base to look at the other reefs, what's happening. And then you've got yellow zones where there's limited, restricted um, fishing for recreational, but no commercial. And then you've got blue zones, which are for open slather for fishing and commercial fishing. But the green zones, 
you know, it's been proved, and, and again, published papers, scientific papers have shown that the green zones are a good thing because the fish move on from those areas to other areas and, you know, it's giving fish a chance to recover. Yeah. And, 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 and apparently on those reefs, not only the protection of the fish, but it's also the protection of the coral. The coral is more prolific in those areas as well because it's all intertwined. You know, the fish rely on the coral, coral rely on the fish, so on and so forth. So those zones have, uh, have definitely worked well. Mm -hmm. The coral sea, on the other hand, that's taken a lot longer to get there. You know, back in, I think, um, when Labour was in back in 2010 and back in now, but Peter Garrett was the environment minister way back then. That was a long time ago. We asked them to come out in the boat a long time ago. We asked Penny Wong to come out in the boat a long time ago. The trouble with politicians is they don't actually come out and see what's going on. It's always frustrated me at many of our meetings that we've had with the government it frustrates me you ask them to come and see but no they just sit behind the desk and rely on everyone else give them the feedback it's, it's very uh, it probably it's it's probably based on how many television camera crews they can have as well uh, votes 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 but anyway yeah. look, we, 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 uh, we we battled for a long time for the coral sea and you know i'm on a personal level, I'm about sustainability. I'm not about protectionism and closing everything down, not at all. There's many, many stakeholders. Um, I eat fish. I go out and I catch fish. You know, I, I spear fish. I'm a bit more selective. Although I find it a bit of a struggle. I go out and, uh, you know, no. <laughs> I prefer to look at them than catch them. But I, but I do yes. eat them. So I don't <laughs> want to be too much of a hypocrite. But I, I think it's sustainability is the important thing. So there's a place for everyone. And none of us can lay claim to having it all protected or none of us can lay claim to being allowed open slather to fish. But I, I believe there's room to get the balance, you know. Yeah. And so the Barrier Reef Marine Park, I think we've got it not too bad. And, and the, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, and they, uh, they do a fantastic job of managing it. There's no doubt about that. Coral Sea Marine Reserves, they were proclaimed in 2018, and um, which is wonderful. We've actually been, we're not putting it out there yet, but we, we got a grant to develop um, moorings um, for out in the Coral Sea. So we are, we're in the process of, we, we, we got a grant for over half a million to develop and evolve a mooring system that's going to work in the Coral Sea. So we've We've developed that with a, a local company here and through a, a, a Kiwi company. Um, it's a big rubber bungee cord type mooring, which is, um, I think, is going to revolutionise moorings up and down the Barrier Reef. So, so this is to save sort of anchor damage. Yeah. So this, exactly right. So the, the old yeah. style of wrapping chains around a rock. or And the coral sea, the problem is it's, you've just got very steep yeah. walls with only small heads. So you, a lot of moorings have got, you might have blocks um, or big screw mooring. So we've developed a, a system that um, we'll be doing a big promotion of it and then putting out to the media once it's done. We've, we've got all the equipment and we're about to install them. And uh, so we're quite excited about that because we've got um, moorings that will be put in Osprey, Flinders, Homes and, and Bougainville Reef. So we'll do away with all, you know, all any... We're getting, uh, we're getting close to the end of the time. Right? No, so we've only we've, just yeah. started. No, I know, but it's um, that's what it seems like, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. It's uh, we. There's a couple of minutes left. Um, what's the length of the trips that you do? We do. You can do a three night, four night, or seven night. Right. So, and and and, I, and as I said, we've got. If I said the expeditions that we run right now, if anyone had never been to Australia. If there are, we've got the fly dive, so so the reason we don't we're not diving off Cairns, we fly to more remote areas where we think this you know better diving, and um, so you can do a three night, you fly in and do three days of diving, and um, and it's on the ribbon reefs, it's fairly sheltered diving, it's good for experience, but even new divers, newcomers, it's a good expedition for them. They're not exposed to the Coral Sea. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend an inexperienced diver go out to the Coral Sea because you simply wouldn't appreciate it if you're worried about all your skills. Yeah. So the three, the, the, the fly dive cod hole is perfect for beginners and experienced divers alike. 
So that's the Shui night. We've got the four night, which is a fly dive coral sea, where we go out to the offshore reefs, which is all the big blue and sharks right. and all the rest of it. Wonderful. Or you can combine them both and stay on the vessel for a week for seven nights. So we go away for seven nights at a time. And then beyond that, though, we've got other expeditions which go, we dive everywhere from Townsville all the way to Cape York. So we've got lots of other stuff to do as well, but I don't encourage folks to do that. If they're going to come here for the first time, they want to experience the best of the Barrier Reef. It's a three-night or a four-night fly dive or the seven-night coral sea exploratory. And I believe that the, uh, the food on board is supposed to be absolutely superb. It is. We've got chefs on board. Small Sport is a big, roomy vessel. She's a big yeah. catamaran. She's got 10 and a half meters width. We've got three layers, three decks, sorry. We've got the dive deck. The accommodation is all on the same deck as the dive deck. So you come out your accommodation straight on the dive deck. Very big lounge midship. And we've got a lovely big sun deck up top. Sounds perfect. Now, one last question. Are you going to the ADEC show this year? I am, yeah. And Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. Mate, I shall, well, we'll be able to drink beer together up there. We will, we will. I and look I'll forward to that. find out um, which hotel so we can all hang out yeah. at the same hotel. So it'll be good. Now, Craig, thank you so much. Sophia, I'm going to hand over to you now. But uh, once again, Craig, that was absolutely superb. It was good to catch up. Thank you. Pleasure, Strikey. Good to see you. And I'll see you soon. Yes, indeed. Over to you, Sophia. Thank you, David. Thank you, Craig. Thank you so much for the engaging session. It felt like I was listening to two friends, two long-time friends catching up rather than like a like a professional inf informative session. It was informative at the same time, but it, it felt very homely and heartwarming to hear the two of you speak so friendly for another. So thank you so much for, for, for this very insightful sharing and thank you for the listeners for tuning in to this session. Um, we will thank you, David and Craig, for taking off your busy taking time off your busy schedule to join us here for this one hour sharing. And I believe the two of you have many other things to, to catch up on. So so uh, we can quickly end this session here and you can you guys can continue with your with your, with your chit chat for another after this. Yeah. So thank you so much guys for tuning in and I will see both uh, Craig and uh, David at our ADEX show this coming September and hope Look all of to that. Yeah. And I hope to see the rest of the audience there too. Thank you so much guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Craig. Thank Bye. Bye-bye. See you, Strikey.